us for so much we can. Yes, absolutely. So, hello, everybody. I am here with Alexander Bart and Kettle Last, as well as Daniel Frager. We haven't done an episode for a couple of months now. We've sort of been chilling out for a bit, but I wanted to get these guys together to do a bit of a techno social end of year. And as Alex just said just now, it's not just like end of 2021, but kind of end of whatever this phase has been whatever that is certainly that's how it feels to me so i've been doing techno social for a couple of years now and to date it's been mostly networking and talking about ideas and getting visibility and finding out kind of what's going on and beginning to build collaborations but increasingly to me now it feels like the real the real work the real interesting place is actually building stuff out of these collaborations real stuff that is on the ground as well as negotiating and interoperating through the digital, through the internet, actually trying to address the kind of the technological and the political challenges today, which of course is what these podcasts, this whole space has been talking about for the last two years and this meaning crisis stuff of what do we do about sense making? What do we do about meaning? What do we do about exponential technologies? However, and this is something that I've been kind of exploring with the Manifesto Media Academy students as well, there's a kind of disconnect often between the amount of talking that's going on and the amount of podcasts and the amount of YouTube channels and the sense of actual uh, kind of tangible changes in, in life or in the networks that people are part of. And I'm kind of noticing among some of the younger students, especially, there's a kind of desire to be part of something that feels like it's it's moving a bit more. I mean, in a sense, there's kind of been this proliferation of channels and podcasts all talking about stuff, saying we need to figure out what's going on. And it kind of crosses a threshold and then just becomes a kind of peak hysteria where everybody's got a channel saying, what the hell's going on? What the hell do we do next? And impossible or very difficult to kind of navigate through that. Um, so with that opening, I guess I kind of sling it over to you guys. Let's riff around this theme for a bit on maybe where we think we're at or these communities are at and what is the kind of the interesting next steps. Okay, I can take the first one there. So um, I think besides the fact we experimented with digital so intensely lately and, and discover, we're discovering now how digital and physical must meet and we're exploring that next. I also sense that uh, we've arrived at a point where we can talk about an Anglo Europe. We can talk about an English speaking Europe in the sense that the English and the Americans refuse to speak any other language but their own. And, and since their language is the dominant language, it's the new Latin, then everybody else has to speak English. And we've seen a, a connection there with Germany, uh, Benelux, Scandinavia, the Baltic countries, and, and certain English-speaking people around Europe have connected. And, and we four are an example of that. The four of us are four men who now uh, live across Europe at the moment, and we're all English-speaking when we talk to each other, at least, to express ourselves in the English language. So finally, we're seeing an Anglo-Europe taking place. And we're also, we're also four, four of us part of a men's movement that is Anglo-European. It has English as its, its, its shared language because you have to be shared language be, 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 with, between, in, in between any tribe you work with. It has to be shared language and it happens to be English, this one. And we now work in over 20 countries, mostly around Europe and, and other parts of the world too. But we, it's, it's very Anglo-European. So I see, I see the birth of an Anglo-Europe that I find very interesting. This also means that discourse, for example, in Holland and England and Sweden are now very interconnected with one another. And we're seeing things now rapidly move from one place to the next. So, for example, addressing the meaning crisis and see where we're going next, we have certain answers. Uh, it's now an international discourse. It's not really taking place in one of these places. But we can see the local discourses and the local languages occurring at the same time. And they're much slower and they're far behind. But because they have more access to politics and power, therefore, they have more influence. And they, this is why we're still seeing a difference in what's going on in Sweden, England, and Holland. There are similarities. Ideas travel very quickly these days. If George Floyd is killed in America, we have anti-George Floyd demonstrations around the world, even to the point in Sweden we demonstrate because George Floyd was killed. But when the same thing happens in Sweden, nobody pays attention to it because the Swedish media is completely Americanized because they're all going Anglo-European. So Anglo-Europe is the empire, the cultural empire. I think all four of us are located within right now. I think our work going forward in the next few years will be within an Anglo-European context. We will travel widely around Europe, all four of us. 
we see tons of people, mostly men, but also a lot of smart women, and certainly some women we, we sleep with. And, and, and therefore, that's going to be the context, for at least for the four of us and most of our friends going forward. But I, I would start there, and then I would like to look into the actual topics, because I think, I think we're seriously moving towards the cultural revolution of the West. And I mean that exactly as the Chinese culture revolution, where the Chinese culture revolution was setting up kids against their parents, you know, with disastrous results. I think the Western culture revolution is setting up men against women. And I think it's going to be even more disastrous we proceed. Then I'll take that. And I like how you set up the sort of the fluid class, people like us who are sort of uh, that fluid element on top of the Anglo-European empire feels to me an interesting way to to already posit what will come next. Namely, you just spoke about the cultural revolution. We will speak in this podcast, in this session, a lot about what's what's happening, all the revolutions uh, taking place within within our culture. And there's many ways to address it. There are ways. There are people who want to prevent it, uh, prevent the decline of you know, of, through the climate change. Uh, some people are on one side of the political spectrum. Some are on another. And the conflict. There's a tremendous conflict taking place, right? Uh, what I want to bring to the table is that that conflict. I, I, I don't feel inclined to take a part on it. And in many ways, I am delighted that it is taking place. It's, it's not conf- like, if there is something dying right now, then why not let it die? What's scary about letting it die? Why should we save something or what should we save from this Anglo-European post-1945 establishment? Uh, I, I feel like I haven't been convinced that there should be something to save from the previous elements. And I feel like an, an interesting dialectical move might be to identify with this movement itself because, uh, to see what comes up next in the same way that Latin speakers uh, at the, uh, during the fall of Rome balkanized. And obviously we know that this balkanization is happening today in the, in the newest sphere, so to speak, balkanized and, and each of them created their own tribes and their own movements. And we are an example of one of those uh, so my point, my question to, to throw back to you guys is, uh, what is there to save? Why should we save it? And why should we not just go with it? So I, I can I can respond to that. Um, first, in that context, I want to sort of emphasize that um, although I have been very much a part of the podcasting network and the YouTube space over the last two years and have used sort of the corona years as a as a withdrawal and a space for thinking as opposed to a space for radical acting uh, i never really identified with the sense making or meaning uh crisis um what i was doing mostly with this youtube space was basically building up what bard and i would call the root of the phallus Um, And what I mean by the root of the phallus is is that I've gone back to the foundation stones of Western culture, um, which I see in two main main forms of thinking, which is one is dialectical thinking, and the second is unconscious thinking. So... When it comes to what should we save in the post-Anglo-European, post-1945 world, I think it's that what we should save is what that post-1945 world forgot, which is dialectical thinking and unconscious thinking. Um, And what really took the place of dialectical thinking and unconscious thinking was a type of naive scientism on the one hand, and a naive spiritualism on the other hand, the naive scientism is disconnected from us as subjects, whereas the naive spiritualism is basically about positive imaging instead of doing actual dark, confronting actual darkness inside of ourselves, and then realizing that the actual darkness inside of ourselves and the way we think about the world are fundamentally connected. They're not disconnected at all. So I think that that's really where I would situate myself. Um, And 
maybe the only other thing to say is um, OG Rose recently, uh, just a few days ago, did a really good video on the meaning crisis as a sign of hope, where he was saying that what the meaning crisis is, is actually um, an, a, a positive sign in a form of negativity that we have higher standards of ourself for meaning, meaning that we are no, there's a small group of people, which we're loosely associated with, who are not content to identify with the forms of meaning, whether they be political ideologies, whether they be religious ideologies, whether they be racial or gender ideologies that provide meaning for people. So we're not identifying with fascism. We're not identifying with communism. We're not identifying with a certain gender war. We're not identifying with a certain racial war. We are basically in a negative space where there's a lack of meaning. And this is the space where I think knowledge has to be treated as dialectical and unconscious thinking has to be thought of as very real and very much active on the ground when we organize. I can add to that and also respond to Daniel. So first of all, I'm not an accelerationist. And there's a reason why. I think accelerationism is lazy and decadent because it, it's always taken from the observer who's distanced from everything and not part of it. But when they come after you, when the enemy comes after you, you're forced to being an activist. You cannot decide when you're going to be an activist or not. You cannot decide that this is not the time to be an activist and stay out of something because you are part of society at all times. You cannot be a philosopher who's not an activist because otherwise they will drag you out and force you to become an activist anyway. I deal every day with mental disease and I specialize on ma male mental health. I deal every day these days in Sweden with guys who are now being prosecuted and sentenced for rape for sexual acts they never even committed because the gender war has gone totally through the roof in Sweden. So I've got loads of these cases. That's now. That cannot wait. All I can say is that the establishment, I couldn't care less. I want them to die as quickly as possible. I want politics as we know it to die. I want industry as we know it to die. I want academia as we know it to die. I can't wait for industrialism and the previous paradigm of capitalism to die, but it's going to be replaced with an autocracy of an attentionist, informationalist age. And that has to be built properly. And we are part of it. We are the protopians. Like Cadell said, we're building the root of the phallus to then be ready to build the phallus on top of it. And I want to challenge you with here is to bring back Marx on, to be added to Hegel here. I think right now, for example, that climate change is a pseudo issue. I really think it is. Climate change to me right now, that is the Salvation Army trying to, to outmouth the Marxists in the street when the workers are fighting for their rights. When the workers come up and say, no, the realness of class warfare is the realness of the society we live in right now. The fucking Salvation Army has no business in the street right now. They must be removed. Climate change is a pseudo issue. All of the woke shit that's going on, pseudo issues creating by the classic decadent bourgeoisie who then using woke to disguise the fact the real issue right now is class. Because the differences in class, both capitalist class structure is worse than ever. And the Texas class structure is worse than ever. These are the two massive class structures we need to deal with right now or else we're just gonna blow it all up. That is the real meaning crisis, it's not a crisis of meaning. It's a crisis of avoiding the meaning of the class war. That's where I think we're at. I totally agree with that. And I, I just want to sort of re-emphasize um, the way Bard is bringing back Marx um, is I think the way to bring back Marx is to focus on conflict as opposed to focusing on positive ideology. So as long as we're focusing on conflict, Marx is very um, uh, useful as, as, a, as a tool um, to move away from identity warfare towards class conflict and, and, and again, um, to avoid the trap of Marxism, which is thinking that you have a positive image in your head of what communism will look like. That's the trap. Mm. I mean, there's something to build here, which is kind of based on the conversations, at least some of us were having last week with, uh, with Thomas Amalric, where he was kind of emphasizing this point that in culture, if your culture, if your work is not providing you enough money to have a house and start a family or raise children, 
or at least giving you some kind of the fantasy that that could be possible, then there's going to be a big issue. And that's a sight of the kind of class conflict today is that there's a lot of a lot of people, a lot of men, a lot of women who with their current working lives are not feeling like starting a family, whatever these kind of fantasies about uh, social structure that have existed probably cross generationally for a long time, they don't line up anymore. That's probably why there's a lot of people coming into men's work today. They're going, okay, I've got a dick in 21st century. I don't know quite what to do with it. Um, But this is also kind of, there's a pivot out of the meaning crisis conversations that exist here. I remember someone I was talking to recently saying he was really into this whole podcasting space until he had a personal crisis with a woman. And then he just lost interest in it. It was like, there's something about trying to understand sexual relationships today, familial relationships today that isn't really addressed in the kind of abstract philosophy that's been going on in a lot of spaces through the last two years. Well, I, I, uh, sorry, go ahead, go ahead, Bart. Okay, like, so I, the, the problem here is that you must remember that if there is one major conflict that we all try to avoid all the time and the name of that conflict is class, that is Mark's great insight. That means that men and women should be together. So men and women should fight the class war together. That's what it means. And when men and women are separated and going into gender war, and that gender war is now spreading from Scandinavia to Germany, to the UK, to the United States. The United States is moving towards identity politics madness. That's what it's moving towards. With the gender war is at the foundation of it. First, it is woman against man. Then it is gay against straight. Then it is black against white. Then it's all the other identities to avoid class conflict. That's what we're doing men's work. We're doing men's work because we're men. Precisely, we can go back to the women who are doing their women's work to say we're on the same side. We're doing men's work precisely to avoid the gender war or to fight against the gender war itself as men with women who are also opposed to gender war because the real war that needs to be fought is the class war. And the class war is actually two class wars. That makes it so complicated this time. It's both the capitalist class war undeniably at the bottom. But on top of that, even worse, the attentionist class war, which is the class war on the internet itself right now. Mm. And I think that's been a big motivation with a project like the Manifesto Media Academy is the idea of, to actually start thinking and teaching about the the internet landscape or the, the attentionist landscape, if you will. Like there's people coming to men's work and saying, okay, what do I do about sex? But still thinking within the context of capitalism. Or just kind of thinking, okay, I'm going to do this life, but I'm on the internet now, rather than thinking into the radically new ways that the internet is kind of opening up to us. And this is something that me and Daniel and Cadell have been thinking about as well in the last couple of weeks is kind of what sort of work could we do in and around techno social, whether it be with consulting as people in this slightly netocratic world with people still in the world of traditional industry. We're trying to build a kind of more long-term educational establishment. Um, I mean, Cadell, your conversations recently uh, with Alexander as well with Michelle Bowens and kind of starting to think about what a Web3 platform might look like using NFTs to provide some kind of ecosystem for sharing value in a way that goes beyond just um, capitalist exchange. That feels hot as well. I can give you two examples here. For example, you can get the family, you can get the house, but you need a loan. A loan is castration. A loan will make you keep quiet. That's exactly what capitalism has done for the last 50 years. It's made us all go and borrow money to buy all the things and then pay them back. And then we paid it all back at 70 years old and we're already, we've been castrated our entire lives and they were almost over it. So just Viagra left, right? It's like loan and then Viagra and then you're dead. The other one is that, Woman is somebody you need to do therapy with. It's like you have to meet woman, do therapy with her. It starts by seeing her. It starts by having a date, which is a therapy session. It starts by having a relationship, which is a therapy session. It starts by having a therapy session to either dissolve the marriage or, or at least to save it, right? Who came up with that idea? To me, it was always the warriors, the, the man and the woman on the same side on the barricades that was the most romantic idea. Why don't we date women who are on the side, same side as us? We start with the common ground. Then you date women. Then you have a great sex life. And you need a fucking man enemy to do that. But there's no shortage of enemies right now. There's no shortage. To begin with, all these people who avoid the class war. All these people who go for the gender war, all the people who, who do identity politics, they're enemies. So date women who hate identity politics and you'll be a man. And don't take loans, you know? Two things to start with that I think could increase, you know, the efficiency and efficacy of our sex lives intensely. 
I'm, I'm <clears throat> struggling to understand something uh, and going back a little bit on the conversation about uh, where's the excess. So, you know, Zizek at some point says that uh, as God died in the early 20th century, the Christian tradition survived precisely in the excess in, uh, uh, in these revolutionary Marxist movements and, and, and movements for equality and, and, and communism. And in many ways, he says that the only way to, way to be a Christian is to be an atheist Christian. And I find that interesting because it's the moment of coincidence of the opposites and it's a moment of excess. It's, it's really like, so, so what if we apply the same type of thinking to the meaning crisis, right? Uh, what's the point at which the meaning crisis fulfills itself by being absolutely denied and, and you know, canceling itself out? That's my point with letting it die. Canceling, canceling itself out, uh, what remains? What still moves after uh, we completely negate the impulse to save men, to save groups, and to identify with this group of men who are supposed to do X, Y, and Z. Why should I? Um, you know, maybe some people should, but I still struggle to identify because I, where's the risk? Where's the excess that will pain the future? Because for example, Owen, uh, to, to, to reply directly to your question about the web 3.0 and NFTs and all of that, isn't that just capitalism being even more capitalist than ever? Where's the excess? Where's the breaking it? And And, and that's what... I am struggling with, and that's why I think we haven't like negated the whole thing enough. I we can need to go a little bit deeper re- before we come back. Let me let me respond to that. So, I think yes, I think you can apply the logic of negation of negation to the meaning crisis. So, like you go into the full negativity, there's a meaning crisis. The negation of negation is the root of the phallus. You go to the root of the problem of the meaning crisis, which is the root of the phallus, which is that you've got to get your body. You've got your thinking has to be connected to the root of your body. You have the to be root of the phallus is is pure risk and and it's pure like lack yes, of identification and, with the movement and with advice. It's like so, so Nietzsche Nietzsche would totally agree with you. Like when you're connected to the root of the phallus, you're connected to risk. You become a real dice thrower. You're you're really taking risk with your life. You're taking risk with your body. Uh, yeah. You're you're not just thinking. You're you're thinking in a body and you're and 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 you're 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 alive. You're <laughs> it's risky to take to and you're not within a bureaucratic structure which is predicting everything right. and every movement. So 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 there's a lot of what the meaning crisis is is slowly tiptoeing towards something that's actually terrifying, which is that you have to you know, you have to fundamentally be there. And one of the things that's missing in these tiptoeing towards the meaning crisis is direct conversation about sexuality and direct conversation about sexual difference. So not only do I not see my YouTube channel, for example, in the category of the meaning crisis work, but also the other important aspect of the work I've been doing over the last two years has been mostly self-referential work with men circling. So when you're in a certain, that, that, that's, I think, one necessary step for young men today who are struggling with how do I be a man? How do, you know, how do I have a dick in the 21st century? Find a man circle, sort of come to terms with your masculinity, come to terms with your masculine energy, and then you can be the type of thinker and you can be the type of man that can, can, can positively enter into a relationship with a woman in the way that Bard's talking about, where you can actually go to war on the same side with women. Because the problem today is that a lot of men are unconsciously ashamed that they're men. They don't really, they're not really connected to their dick. They're, they're quasi, they, 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 they are kind of mostly thinking that their sexual energy is a form of violence and aggression against women only as opposed to, to, to sort of owning their sexuality and um, maturing their sexuality to the point where your sexuality is exactly what a woman wants, which is a man, who, which, which is a man who knows how to have sex. And, 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 a, and a lot of your meaning problems will be solved by that if you know how to have sex properly. They will not. I, the hidden wait, wait, assumption, wait, wait. the hidden yeah, assumption yeah. behind, no, 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 no. The hidden assumption behind, and I follow you, Kadal. I, I really do. But like the hidden assumption is that these problems will at some point be solved, and we will do the work, and we'll all hold hands together, and suddenly we'll no, be. No, I'm not trying to. No, 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 wait, wait, Daniel. I know you're Daniel, not. I know you're Daniel, not. Daniel, play, play, play. 
Dan, you're mixing up two things. What, what Kadalis talked about is the timeless aspect of paradigmatics. So yeah. if the values we're constructing right now, the paradigmatics of the times we live in, which is the end of the meaning crisis, we can stop using the word. What are the paradigmatics we're looking for? I want to answer the question now, seriously, instead of asking it again. Yeah. Okay. The answer is called paradigmatics. It has a timeless aspect to it. That's what Kadal is talking about. The time-specific aspect of that, though, that's specific for our times is another one. Uh, you're looking for excess right now that we're all dealing with. I can ask any 44-year-old woman in Sweden right now, which is the biggest social problem she's got. And she's got a name for it. It's called spam. It's called spam. She's spammed. We're all spammed. That's the excess of the times we live in. We're drenched in information we never asked for. We're drenched in advertising, commercials, desperate capitalism at the end of it. Capitalism is now in its farcical state. It's perfect. Pathetic. And what has capitalism done then? It's tried to conquer the old institutions. It's tried to conquer politics. It's forcing politics on us, identity politics on us, because of course capitalism is avoiding class. It's going for identity politics big time. Every fucking corporation, they're fucking whorehouses today, and they're throwing woke shit at us. And any decent 44 year old mom of three can call it spam. That's the excess. That means the answer to that excess is also there. It's called the algorithm. And that's exactly why the most important struggle in our time next to the class war itself, or possibly part of it, is to fight for the free and open algorithm against the corruption of money of the algorithm. That's what, what, why it's a class struggle. Against the manipulation of politics of the algorithm, which is a woke shit politics from corporations and, and governments come in. And against the conformation of the old academia and mass media, which is the media message that we must all be the same, meaning we must look different, but we must think alike. You have it right there to me. That that's quite obvious in 2021. Let, that's, let me that's a great clarification. Yeah. Let, let me let me also add that I'm not in any way pointing towards man and woman becoming a harmonious balance with each other. But I am saying that if you're not connected to your body, you're not going to be and deep to the root of the fallacy, you're not going to be connected to real meaning. But that real meaning is going to require that your thinking is constantly connected to the contradiction with the other. If real meaning is connected to the real contradiction with the other and the tension between you and the other. So that does not mean that you're going to be in a harmonious balance. That does not mean you have to get married. That does not mean you have to have kids. It could mean that you get married and have kids, but that does not determine that you get married and have kids. What it will mean is that you have meaningful, deep relationships with the other, and you're constantly thinking them through, and your identity is changing as a consequence of that involvement. It also means that you have different archetypes. So what happens is that, say you and woman together have something to fight against. Let's romanticize here. Let's be on the barricades, okay. right? Now, if a man and woman unify in that, not only will they have great sex because of it, because that's what happens, but they will also discover the different and they can appreciate it. We do this immense work too. We say that the priest must, in front of all the men, worship and admire the chief. The chief must bend down and worship and admire the priest for being radically different from one another and therefore having different archetypes and having different roles in a shared tribal struggle. That's what man and woman need to do. Man and woman need to discover we're different and wow, that's great. It's not just pussy and dick and everything else is then removed. That's the tragedy of our times that we try to that we try to sort of pseudo-sexualize the relationship by making a relationship of man and woman who have nothing but pussy and dick as difference. That's what radical feminism teaches us, and it's weird and sick. It's precisely by seeing man and woman as very different and having different roles in a shared struggle that we can move forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. I totally agree That's with Bard that one of the tra like yeah maybe the central tragedy of our time is that we're no longer able to see sexual difference as a positive. The only I, I, beautiful clarification. The only thing that comes to mind now, uh, and it's something that I that I had to, to note down, Bart, because you mentioned um, spam is the excess today. Uh, the only thing that can sort of solve it or deal with it is the algorithm, and that we should fight against something. And I, I my mind immediately went to why don't we fight along something? Why don't we fight along the corruption and money? Okay, um, then, then get a job at Google and you're in it because Google are struggling with it right now. Google's algorithm was better 15 years ago than it is now. <clears throat> Google's <throat> algorithm, the company was still naive and basically employed a lot of innovators, was a really fantastic company, the algorithm that was free and open. Basically, the algorithm reflected you. 
and reflected people like you. And then it added a small element of antagonism, which is that what if every tenth song in your playlist is a complete surprise, right? So you can change and you can mutate and you can transmutate, you become a different person as you go along, which is the secret of success today. The difference between a netocrat and a consumptarian fundamentally today. So the consumptarian will only go for what is to be expected and will never want anything to change. Whereas a netocrat is somebody who loves change and embraces it because the change then requires antagony. Antagony or antagony is key here. That's how you build the great algorithm. It's fundamentally very simple. Okay, what Google have then done is that Google have allowed their algorithm to be corrupted by money. So the ad moved into the algorithm. It allowed manipulation of politics to move into the algorithm by employing diversity officers who then wanted their perspective into the very algorithm of Google. And then it allowed the conformation of the academic world outside to have a say, meaning a lot of people who shouldn't even be there who were from the old paradigm moved into Google and they had their opinion made. And that's why Google search engine is horrible today, it's bad. But that also opens up the space for new algorithms. I think the new algorithms and new search engines will be created by fucking decentralized hackers with blockchains who will eventually discover we don't wanna be Google. That's why I think if you take part in creating one of those companies or be part of those networks, you're the most radical activist in the world today. I think hackers who go for decentralization and what have a free and open algorithm they provide to people where people know through transparency that the algorithm reflects them and their antagony and nothing else, that's what we need to get. And I think it's competition between algorithms that will solve that problem. I think I wanna, you have a point. I wanna be antagonic here and, and a little bit provocation very quickly. What would be more antagonic to meaning crisis thinking itself than embracing the corruption of Google itself? Instead of going into capitalism and let's go play the game of innovation again. Let's get five guys and get a basement somewhere and let's like just fucking bootstrap. Daniel, guys. I just told Daniel, you're lazy sitting on the side as if you could afford it. If I would sit on the side of Sweden and become an accelerationist and just let things happen, all the three brothers I've got right now who are innocent and have been doomed to being sentenced to rape and have their lives destroyed, will then be sent to, 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 to prison and have their lives destroyed. I can't accept that. I can't accept the guys who walk through the door right now suffering from psychiatric disease are not being treated. I'm right now in the middle of the crisis itself. It's not a meaning crisis. This is a crisis of men being attacked by completely, you know, radical feminist women who are bitter because they don't get fucked. That's essentially what Sweden is like right now. And I can't accept and just sit by the side and think I can remove myself from the territory. Accelerationism requires that you remove yourself from there. That's why I think it's a bourgeois position. It's not really radical. That's my problem with it. I'm not saying full identification. I'm, I'm saying the negation of that identification. I'm not saying, or at least what my intuition is pointing towards is less um sure let's all become woke i'll be an hr manager at some big corporation no um but rather what excess exists within these large behemoths for they will fall and they will like eat themselves up uh, uh, bureaucratically maybe it's take, gonna take a long time but uh no no general i think this this is no? a guess this is 21 it's a guess and it's a, it's an end of year uh episode uh, I think Facebook is beyond salvation. I think Google can still be solved. I think Coinbase and Basecamp are the future of tech. And I love decentralized hackers and the kind of work they do if they can only get the shit together and start to create the new public platforms on which the algorithms are free and open, that would be salvation. So I think you get different options right now, tech, and you should look at each one of these different options in separately and not just in general say tech is doomed because that's also lazy. That's, that's not taking, because you're right. You can either take a Fraga-esque position and say, I'm going to go into the behemoth itself and work from the inside. A lot of people do that at Google right now. Tristan Harris, for example, is trying. You can also say that I don't think, I think Google is beyond salvation, at least from me. I don't think I can do the job within Google. I hope somebody else can. I'll rather go for Coinbase and line up in front of Brian Armstrong. I hope he's the good guy who understands the struggle. And just because for his own self-interest, he knows that he needs to create a free and open algorithm. Otherwise, he's dead and over. 
And I think, I think if you do text today, I would advise you, no matter how cynical you are, no matter your motives, I would advise you that the free and open album is going to be such a big thing very soon that you might as well go for it, even if you don't want to, because at the end of the day, it's the only way you're going to be successful. And that's what I want. That's the kind of environment I want to create. I want, to, I want it to be absolutely impossible. Just like big corporations cannot refuse to pay tax, at least somewhere, right? You've got to force these behemoths down somewhere. And I think the free and open algorithm is a struggle right now. And for me, that is the tensionless class struggle. But I don't want to say that I'm going to avoid the capitalist class struggle because of class differences that are enormous when it comes to money these days. That struggle has to be fought as well. Mm -hmm. I think if I might throw something in there, because Daniel, a few minutes ago, you were saying something about, is this talking about Web3 or NFTs? Is it not just more capitalism? And I think the hope is no. Like I was talking to someone yesterday about what is the hope say with the manifesto men's network? What is the potential contained within it? Well, collaboration networks of people who know each other and who are able to trust each other and able to create genuine value and yes, raise capital together, but be doing it from a, a teleology that's not just making as much money as possible. There's actually a kind of a social or an activistic or an artistic impulse within it, which is, this is the class struggle through and through. So in the kind of bourgeois paradigm, 5%, 1% of people could say they actually were doing that and the rest are going into the bureaucracies, right? I think the hope with this uh, these digital collaboration networks is that more people, this digital proletariat, will be able to work and act and do politics in a way that is, it, there's essentially just more agency there. And I don't think that's a trivial position. I agree. And it's not like I am arguing in favor of the bourgeois detached position of just let it burn and you can just wank while Rome burns. Rather, <laughs> I'm saying something precisely the opposite, really, which is, um, yes, pure and free algorithm and, and yes, uh, dialectical unfolding in a positive way, in a in way that I want to be an activist about. Um, but precisely because I... I you know, my, my, my stance and my, my, my intuition tells me that there's, uh, there's something to th this struggle, in this struggle, there will be, very sadly, so many casualties. The paradigm will change. We're at the, like, at the beginning of the conversation, I wanted to say something like, this is the death of Pax Americana. This is no small deal, right? This is an end of an era. Maybe you have a whole paradigm of, of sedentary civilization. We're going into something mad uh, that we are not even able to, to fathom. Um, and the great stream, the great phylum that is like fucking penetrating the future is techno-capitalism and its incessant march. Now, even within great corporations, those who will adapt will thrive and those who will fall, they will fall. And that, I have no moral judgment about that. There's, this is kind of the flow that things take. But and wait a second. So I'm not, I'm not I, I, committed to, to to necessarily like one uh, uh, solution, and I don't, I don't have my my eggs on the basket of the big corporations or the small teams or whatever. But what I'm interested in is um, the actual possibility for innovation, innovation that I feel will happen dialectically, and that to happen dialectically, sometimes they will require that we identify with some some opposites that we like forfeit some potentials to accept others. Uh, and that might mean uh, the forfeiture of this idea that it's all gonna be all right, because it probably won't. And that's how we traverse the, the, the great barrier between current paradigm and the next one. Well, I, 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 I'm, I'm involved in an everyday struggle where it's not about a goal, where it's gonna be a right. I think this sounds like a 12 year old fantasizing about the future. Uh, uh, I'm very here and now in the struggle, but I also take the perspective that, for example, there was a pretty golden era with the internet e childhood age between 1996 and 2005. And the problems really started with Facebook and social media. And social media has been created intense problems that we need to solve right now. We have to fight them. And I think the first thing to do is say that techno-capitalism is not the end game here at all. Techno-capitalism is just a bridge between the two paradigms. It is literally techno Capitalism. It's not techno attentionalism. I, I think the thing is, we learn from the algorithms is that once the algorithm is free and open, it doesn't favor capitalism at all because then it would favor the ads. The reason why the ads were separate from the algorithms from the very beginning on the Google search engine was because the ads are just desperate voices from the past that try to, you know, 
let us know that there's a fucking loser with tons of money here. So there's a loser who makes crappy shit and has no friends. And he goes to the bank and he gets a loan and he throws the money to that. We know right now that the ads are desperation and Google and Facebook have cynically milked it capitalistically. The capitalist part of the company is just milking the losers for money that, you know, the, the, it's the last money they have. But at the end of the day, the algorithm is all about potentialism. The algorithm is an infotainment measurer. The only two things we're concerned with. We want to be informed or educated and we want to be entertained. So we want to be informed in an entertaining way. Not entertainment per se, not information purely, but information being entertaining to us. Infotainment, like Cadillac's fantastic YouTube lectures, very infotaining, right? Infotainment is what you talk about. And that's all algorithms actually measure and should measure and nothing else. And that's the value of tensionalism. And the tensionalist value is moving towards privacy and sacredness. As we're talking so much about spirituality and religion these days. And the private and the sacred was capitalism tries to get its hands into and won't allow it. We won't allow capitalism to get into the private and the sacred. So the private and the sacred then returns. And that is the foundation for tensionalism, where tensionalism beats the shit out of capitalism. Interesting. Well, let, let, let me, me throw, just, okay. very quickly, let me just add this and I'll throw it to you, Godot, because this is actually a question oriented to you. The, like you mentioned spam as the excess, uh, but the excess to me is something that could constitute not only the potential for oppression, but simultaneously, it's in full coincidence and coincidence with the potential for liberation, meaning the things that oppress us are the very things that will liberate us. And that's what I hope, what I mean by, by my previous interventions. And yes. So I, 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 I agree with you for, I guess, so the way you can frame that, uh, the historicity of excess is that lack and excess have to be thought together. So like an excess is always the excess of a lack. So X an excess appears in lack. So if, if you and if anyone wants to understand the philosophy of this, I've got a, a series on the philosophy of lack where we end up doing an episode specifically on excess. So just that they're to be under they're understood they're, they're to be understood together. Um, by going to the root of the phallus and and really um, thinking about our embodied being in the context of techno capitalism, what hopefully will happen is that we become techno social. So we go from techno, so we go from techno capital to techno social to, to, to reference also your, and I think also I'm here trying to also point towards, you know, what the techno social brand could potentially provide in, in thinking about this transition. Um, and, and in order to sort of deepen that, especially in relationship to what Bard was talking about with saying techno capitalism is not the end game and and all of the excess here that's going on in techno capitalism, is that one of the key points that should be taken away from the conversation Bard and I had with Michelle Bowens was that there are four different levels of value uh, ranking uh, in economics. The fourth is commodities. And that's what techno capitalism is exploiting. It's turning everything into uh, a, a commodity. Uh, and it's even wanting to turn the most sacred things in our lives into commodities. So we don't have a, a private sacred anymore. Um, if we fully include the four different value uh, structures of, of our economy, we have to take into consideration commons, gifting, status, and commodities is fourth. But they all have to be thought together. So we have to have a real commons, meaning like, so for example, when I was a kid, my family was a commons because I didn't have to worry about my performance in the job market to get a meal. I didn't have to have a performance in the job market to have clothes on my back. I had a meal. I had clothes on my back. That's a commons. Then you have gifts. So when I was growing up in my family, what does that mean? It means I had, there was a gift economy Every Christmas, we gave gifts to each other. Every birthday, we gave gifts to each other. Then on top of that, there's status. So you have status within the commons, depending on your position. Am I a mother? Am I a father? Am I a child? What's my education level? And all of that has to matter. All of those now doesn't mean, and then, then you have commodities on top of that. 
So what I'm saying is, is that you can't just have a society where everything's a commodity, where your sexual partner is a commodity, where you have to have a, you have to have a real techno social. We have to become techno social. <laughs> this is interesting. So I've been like, I'm reading a bunch of Gerard recently and kind of, we all are familiar with Gerard and his idea that religion is essentially there to mediate and reduce the possibility for violent, um, acceleration amongst people but he had a chapter in one of his books where he's also theorizing money in much the same way saying that when you've got a gift economy especially a gift economy as societies are getting bigger and people don't know each other very well there's an increasing possibility to take a gift as an insult so if i say give cadell an insult and it's something beyond his means to actually pay me back in like then there's a p- potential for some resentment to build there. I'm kind of signifying my superiority by giving him a big, big gift. It's like my dick is bigger than yours, literally. Um, and so money, he thought, could be a way of developing a kind of a neutral ground upon which to media exchanges so they de- don't then develop into conflict. I think this is interesting in the conversation about capitalism now, where it's like... <sighs> Or the class struggles get into a point where the, the ability for, for people to feel fairly remunerated for their work by the bureaucracies that they work in no longer functions sufficiently as to not lead to a kind of resentful buildup there anyway. I think a lot of this resentment is kind of being displaced, say, into the gender wars that we've been speaking about. But the kind of the interesting thinking, and this is like if Gerard is correct in thinking both money and religion are ways of mediating the violence between us. We're kind of thinking, and this is where our our community is going towards, is what are both the new ways of doing religion and the new ways of thinking value to prevent essentially the violent warfare getting to the worst excesses that it could do. Not ending up in the perfect state. I don't think anyone wants to be there. That's kind of Daniel was throwing about. But manageable conflicts as opposed to unbearable tensions. I think you're right, Owen. I would say that the word capital was thrown out in the 1980s and replaced by the word patriarchy. And capital at least was something concrete. It was numbers, right? You, you knew who was wealthy, right? You, you could count the numbers. But patriarchy was just a ghost. Just thrown out and said that there's patriarchy. And it, and it means that all women are innocent victims and can be as resentful as they like, whereas all men are guilty. It means that we, we reintroduce the original sin, but throw it on all men. And all men were guilty of being patriarchs. Patriarchy was suddenly something all men have, if they have a penis, the patriarchy. And Somehow there's a matriarchy hiding here that one day will come forward. It's a very Christian idea. One day will, heaven will arrive and we matriarchy and everything will be fantastic and happy. We'll all sing in Kumbaya in a big chorus of women and children. And the men will sit there as castrated little boys and all men will be dead. That, that is the idea of radical feminism. That is the horror of it. We're now seeing it being developed in Sweden fully because in Sweden it's officially declared since 2006 as the state ideology. It's literally the state ideology of Sweden. If you were going to see the gender wars now being a mass gender war for the entire society, that's Sweden in 2021. And it's bitter and resentful and it's increasingly looking like a massive lynch mob when you know, all the political leaders are now women and these women are losing it. They're just, they're just going mad. You know, they, they just introduced a pro- proposition that prostitution, I mean, buying a sexual, purchase of a sexual service is now equal to the death penalty in Sweden next. It, they're not kidding. They're not kidding. It's so Jacobin, it's hysterical. And it's only because the real fight was capital and spam. But they're trying to imagine there's a ghost called patriarchy, which means that all the hard labor that men put into their lives to support women and make sure women could have tits to feed their kids so the kids could be the future of the men. That whole deal between men and women and children is now dead. I can't think of anything more apocalyptic than that storytelling. I think it's absolutely disastrous. We're right moving into an age of deep cynical nihilism. So before the meaning crisis is over, meaning it can go into ironic and then affirmative nihilism. I think we're practicing ironic nihilism here, but we're a small minority. But I think cynical nihilism is next. And we saw, we wrote about this in the Digital Liberty book. We said the next 50 to 100 years are going to be bloody and horrible because it's exactly what we said would happen. And I think here's this a, put resentment a, is is everywhere. The kind of promise of capitalism, if you take bourgeois ideology at face value, 
is that it's supposed to make people equal, that it's supposed to make things fair. At no, least no, for the bourgeoisie. No, I, no, I wouldn't say you can't blame that on capitalism. Capitalism just said that money is incredibly efficient in removing bullshit from the system, so we can have world trade and anybody can benefit from increased wealth. Because no, but that's it, the point. Anybody and can it work, benefit, and it as works, opposed and to it just works, being yeah. an aristocracy. Anybody can benefit. Yeah, now, that's they, the, and, kind of, the, the yeah, utopian and, yes. promise within it. No, no, but the meritocracy worked. We did get a meritocratic society, but that was apparently not enough for the current lynch mobs. They're not happy with meritocracy because then they would be happy with everybody as an equal opportunity, which I think is the best we could ever achieve in any society. I think there's an end to all struggle, capitalist struggle or Tesla struggle. As well. There's an end when we arrive at equal opportunity. That means that equal opportunity online or equal opportunity when it comes to job promises, equal opportunity to education, equal opportunity to Wi-Fi, whatever you call it. We cannot have an equal opportunity of outcome because that's when madness starts. That's apocalyptic and that's the Jacobins. And that's exactly what radical feminist identity politics people today claim. And they do it precisely because the bourgeois, the petit bourgeois, and they do it precisely because they hate to go to the class war because that would take real effort. And they're all lazy. They're all lazy in the cuckoos. They're screaming for more tax money and screaming for more resources without having to do the hard work. That's it's, the, the lynch mob is lazy. That's exactly why it hates the real struggle, which is class, and goes for a completely symbolic or imaginary struggle, like, for example, the gender war. But now when the gender war is becoming real, it's a different picture. I know you're on mute. Here's a way that I feel could be complementary to, to, to what you're saying of reading this current struggle. Um, I feel like in, 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 in the story of the next uh, few years, hopefully, I feel like the struggle about the sacred, it, it's not going to the excess of, of conflict about ideas and the excess of spam and the excess of information and the whole conundrum that we're thrown into, uh, it won't cause the sacred so much to retreat into a sacred sanctum of a few netocrats who are able to create these cults, but rather it's going to become decentralized precisely as blockchain does it, precisely as technology becomes um, omnipresent and pervasive. It's going to be, the sacred is going to become a part of the world system at large, right? So what this amounts to is the world becomes re-enchanted or re-cursed by ghosts. And isn't that precisely what we're seeing with the class struggles? Isn't wait, wait, the wait, struggles wait, wait, between that, the that, gender? Isn't, isn't, aren't these struggles precisely about sacred values when these people are lazy sacred values, whatever. But what, what, what these conflicts are, are about the presence of the sacred in everyday life of different people. And I feel that these are religious wars, obviously, but it's not one group against another, but they are sort of a decentralized all against all type conflict. And I feel like the new religions or the new movements that emerge from here are going to be sort of built or designed by those who are able to regulate or rule or design these sacred spam to navigate within the chaos. Because what I feel wait, is- Wait, wait, wait. I see what you th 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 think. Yeah, I see what you think. Sorry if I interrupted. Uh, there's no sacred spam at all. Get out of the head. There's just spam. Spam is the excess. So the lack is the algorithm. That was, that's what I pointed out. The free and open algorithm is lacking. And that's what we desperately want to build and have the free and open algorithm. And those who do will then get rid of the spam or the spam gets controlled. So it's no longer a problem. They can, and then the, the major problem of today being online is solved, which is that yeah, they're they constantly under stress from an overfilled mailbox. It's as simple as yeah. that. Everybody is. So that is the excess you asked for. They can so curate don't, it, they don't, can filter they, it, they can no design sacred it. Spam. Sacred spam is to me romantic trash. No, that's a, the, the sacred no, 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 algorithm. No, at large. No, the, the, algorithm, the, the algorithm yeah. must be sacred and it's not sacred now when it's being profaned by Google. So kill Google in that yeah, case, yeah, create yeah, the free yeah, and sure. open algorithm, use the blockchain, tap them together, create a decentralized platform, and it can be done today. That's why that's but, not a utopian idea. That's the point. Okay, okay, I follow you. A different in, in approach, I agree with you precisely what I meant by sacred scam is what you mean, uh, scam is what you mean <laughs> by algorithm. <laughs> Dr. Freud, take a note. But uh, um, th this type of thinking of it's going to be blockchain and this technology and that technology, I just want to bring in something that comes to mind. But this is technology first thinking. Namely, it's it's the problem with every new technology that comes in. People just look at, oh, VR, oh, conversational technology, oh, this. Daniel, oh, how are you going to solve the spam problem without technology? You're off the road. You're going to think about the problems that the technology solves in the first place. You're not going no, to put a gimmick in place. technology can both solve problem and it can also occur new problems. Technology itself is not a problem. Get that out of no, your head. No, it's not, but it is not it the solution itself. 
Is it in this case? It is. You know, in this it's case, a mediator it's the for only, the solution. No, it's the only power. You cannot get rid of spam without technology, period. Yeah, but you cannot get rid of spam by technology alone. You need to mediate yes. technology. No, no. there's a clear problem. I want to get rid of spam. The issue is, I don't think you're talking about the VR thing, Daniel, because you've got experience working there. Everyone wants to say, let's do VR, let's do VR, but they haven't actually got a reasonable use for it. There's and it does nothing. And it does nothing. But when you use it to solve a specific problem that you analyze, that you break down, that you question, all of a sudden you got something. Because like, you're spam. Like, like whatever you want, like the algorithm, like if spam was the problem, then you, when you build the algorithm, it's not going to build itself out of thin air by just uttering the words. You have to question it and understand the functions that it fulfills. And that's where you get to the real gist of it because the functions but that it fulfills are sacred. I can, I can, I can sort of, I can sort of offer a, a structure, something that's structurally useful here um from from the phenomenology of spirit in the in the dialectic between and this is very relevant i think to maybe what techno social wants to do so in the dialectic between individual spirituality and religion so that's crucial in between individual spirituality and religion um there's the emergence of pragmatic instru inst uh, instrumentalization so pragmatic instrumentalization is basically, okay, uh, we can build a VR headset. But in the, in the sort of the, the dialectical conflict of individual spirit, there's the problem of whether or not the instrumental, instrumentalization leads to self-insight. So it's crucial is that you connect basically pragmatics and instrumentalization to self-insight, because without self-insight, the pragmatic instrumentalization is just useless. So in and in that process of basically asking the question, sort of like the a priori question is, is this technology leading to deeper self-insight? Or is this use of technology leading to deeper self-insight? You start to build out the architecture of something that looks like religion. I agree. So the human aspect here, to point what Daniel said and critiqued greatly, is um, that is the human interaction all the time. We, we, when I'm online, I'm co constantly interacting. I'm here, I'm human, deeply human, right? So I don't want to empty a spam box for seven hours a day. And Google made me empty the spam box for three hours a day instead of seven hours a day. Now it's getting close to seven hours a day again. Problem is not solved. So that means the algorithm is crappy. And, and because the algorithm should just get the spam out of the way without creating other problems for me. That's a technological solution I'm looking for. So that I can then spend my time online going religious rather than spiritual when I'm online, which means I can create something way more powerful and meaningful to myself and other people when I'm online and I open the laptop space in the morning and I see a great free and open algorithm that provides me with everything that is me reflecting on me and then adds an antagonist rather than a fucking ad. I don't want the ad there. I want the antagony button there that says that when it's getting too predictable and when I can bear it, because I created the rule of the phallus and I can go phallic, meaning I can go more experimental, more artistic, then I press the antagony button and then I throw the contradiction into the mix. That's all I want really from a screen when I think about what an ideal screen should be like. And I think that's how technology should be designed from now on. And then the constant human interaction with, between us and between the technology is there all the time. That's where the sacred and where the profane resides, Daniel. I completely agree with you on that one. But technology here is required to solve what's fundamentally a technological problem. But then we do with the algorithm. That's, that's okay. The algorithm won't solve that. It won't create anything for us. It's just creating a better platform. I, I really, ag I, I really agree with cases. I, I agree with what Bard's saying. I just, I can't stop laughing at the idea of having a literal antagony button. I'm just like. <laughs> <laughs> I'm teaching that to 19 year olds today and they love it precisely like you do, Cadell, because they knew that if they could press the antagonist button more often, if they did, they'd be more powerful. So we have a clear definition of the difference between a netocratic upper class and a consumptarian underclass in the network society. We have it right there and the 90 years can get it and they know they must both have an upbringing and a self-confidence and a talent and the algorithms and all of this into the mix and the right friends to be able to press the antagony button. But if they do and the more often they do it, <laughs> the more powerful they will be because the more they will look into contradictions and the smarter they be, the more dialectical they will be, right? I think and, that and, and that's, that's, that's it, the, the, sorry, yeah, I'll let you go, Daniel, but I just wanna say that for those listening, 
if you're intimidated by the notion of dialectics or you're intimidated by some of the ideas like that, really one of the core and simplest way to get get your handle hold get get your head around it is that you're thinking in terms of contradiction of identity instead of unity of identity. That's really, you know, that's really what you're playing with in dialectics. Fantastic. I think that one of the nice things about this conversation and about what this new way to understand technology and its use cases can bring, looking at technology as this motor for dialectics by pressing the antagony button, by making myself better, et cetera, is that it also changes uh, our very core presuppositions of what a human should be. Meaning that right now, technology is solved under uh, for specific use cases, like uh, for uh, consumers who want to get a good faster. But the presupposition of that, which is pretty much the paradigm of, of, of today's like super exploitative capitalism that we don't want, is the idea that the user is an individual that wants to uh, you know, fulfill their function faster, get their own thing faster, done, done with it. A utilitarian... Uh, uh, so, to so get the their under- pizza faster. Yeah, and, and the, the underlying the underlying sort of theology, secular theology behind this, which is something that we've all critiqued at length, is sort of individualism, utilitarianism, you know, harder, better, faster, stronger. But as we move forward, we're going to have to ask like deeper questions about the sacred and like deep ontology, meaning like when you click the antagony button and, and if you really click antagony button and if it's a real antagony button, then what it's going to do is going to change the fuck out of you to the point that it's unrecognizable right now when you look at when you order something online. And that's the important bit about like this, 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 the new religion, the new sacred is going to be built uh, or is going to emerge in a really weird fucked up way. But um, so that's something that comes to mind. I, I, the, the elusive I, the I (laughs) is not a, is not a neurological correlate. The I is an other. So when you say, for example, the antagony button is going to change the fuck out of you. That I is an other. You're destined to become other to what you are now. And that's the, isn't that, isn't that sacredness or religion, the reconnection with that other, the continuous, the feedback loop between I'm not something, I'm going to become something else. That's precisely why people love psychedelics, right? Psychedelics is the antagony button of life. Okay, people don't dare, people still don't dare to go outside of their sexual orientation. That's too scary. You don't want to fuck things that doesn't turn you on instantly because you still think your sexual orientation dictates your sexuality, right? Which is kind of boring, but people are very, very unsure about that, unsecure about it. But at least they do take psychedelics. And the people who don't even take psychedelics are the ones who also think they have a predisposition for a sobriety. So they have a certain sober, uh, uh, sober orientation that must stay with at all times. That's why they don't want to do psychedelics or don't dare to. But psychedelics are perfect example because you have no control of what happens and what's very likely to happen if you take a dose of psychedelics that you're going to be totally different person to ours or now especially during the trip and then you have to integrate it afterwards and the integration makes you totally other than what you were before so you got you literally kill yourself to then be reborn into something different three days later that's exactly what psychedelics has done. And that's why I think psychedelics must be explored next to digital. I think it's di- the exact reason why psychedelics is happening now is because it's happening so closely to digital and it's precisely the people who want to leave the old paradigm who are really into the psychedelics. There's, there's the explanation for it. We're already now subconsciously moving towards the antagony button in our own lives. Yeah, and what, what psychedelics does that could also be seen to be replicated in certain creative crafts is the... Uh, it puts you closer to the danger of psychosis, but also you let you drink from its advantages. Namely, all of these things that just wouldn't make sense in sober reality, all of a sudden they can make sense. Holy shit, the sacred is flooding reality. Uh, and so it forces you to reckon with that. But whether we like it or not, due to the advancement of technology and AI, the sacred will be poured onto reality. There's go- not going to be an ability for those who like sobriety to stay sober because technology is already drunkening us. It's already making the whole fa- fabric of reality psychedelic. All the it's, This is the epistemolo- epistemological reorganization of the whole world. So the revolution is happening right now. The ghosts have invaded. And so, you know, designer be designed, uh, sink or swim. And, and that's why I'm always, you know, going on about... <sighs> Ontological design, but I won't go there. I think you're absolutely right, Donald. That's this what it comes in. The 3D glasses didn't work because the 3D glasses were invented by capitalist movie companies who tried to save the cinema. A perfect example. It's not the same of the thing to the same people. Yeah, but 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 
But the VR where you have to take the pill will happen, right? So the VR where you have to take the pill is the real 3D glasses because that the 3D glasses is from the future. And that's the 3D glasses we all know is going to happen, which is but here's the antagonist pill that you take next to the VR experience and without it, the VR experience is sober and bland. So you're right. It's going to be impossible to go into the sacred without going to those realms. And in that sense, the old sacred was public and profane, but now it's challenged to you. It's, it's, it's genius, actually, to put the sacred and the private next to the antagonist button and say that the private and the sacred are impossible without your pressing the antagonist button. Yeah, I think it's yeah. pure and genius to see that. It's pure genius to see that. Thank you for and that. And it's decentralized and it's everywhere. So let's flip this on its head a little bit as well. So if we're talking about, say, the antagony button as what might be the transformative ritual or the, the tantra of digital culture, where are we thinking as the like religious foundations? How are these communities that are going to allow people to, to skillfully use an antagony button, how are they going to be constructed? How do they let, me, the hill let, me, let me jump let me jump in here quick um so because i'm I'm working on I'm actually trying to think through this right now in the in the book that that uh, Bard and I are co-writing it, let, let's think back to Nietzsche's criticism of God is dead and qu questioning the religious foundations of the Western society. I think that if we take the presupposition of I as an other, I think basically what Nietzsche is saying, is that all of the, the Christian orthodoxy, all of the people in religious power, are um, they're not really connected to absolute knowing of themselves. Like, so basically, all of the religious structure is kind of a shell of itself because no one's actually connected to like deep knowing. Uh, and so it's all just sort of empty knowing. So I think that the people who are like, basically where's the religious quote unquote foundation it's with people who are actually connected to the notion of I as another, and they can press the antagony button because they've already included surprise within their, their fundamental being. So surprise is a part of their fundamental being. So, so we have to make a distinction between people who have yet to reach the level where surprise is a part of their fundamental being and they can fundamentally be challenged in their identity and people who have reached that level. And that's a process and you have to go through that process and there have to be barred absolutes for that. Exactly. Brilliant stuff. That's the sutra and tantra that Andrew Sweeney and Thomas Arik and I've explored for the last two years, right? Christianity and Islam are impossible here because Christianity and Islam have banned the antagony button. They banned it. They completely suited religions. They said, you must never press the antagony button is there, you must never press it. And then they pretend that drinking the blood of Christ, the Eucharist and stuff like that is pressing antagony button. No, it's not. It's still in the sutra, right? So what Nietzsche is pointing out here is that only those who differentiate between I before and I after being another and the two different eyes here, and they must be split. There's a sutric eye prior to the experience, an implicate eye. There's an explicate eye, another eye that I have to live with from then on that I integrate afterwards after the experience, right? That is the passage and that's called the barred absolute. That's why we do lock in psychedelics. We don't throw them around or throw them in the drinking water. And that's exactly why all the culture got upset when throwing LSD into the drinking water as proposed in the 1960s, which was an absolutely mad idea. Okay, why? Because LSD can be thrown into the water of those drink after the pressed antagony button. I think the same way, this is where digital psychedelics really do reflect each other. I think this is the key. The antagony button is the word the four of us should own because he just invented it today. We should keep staying with that because the antagony button, both in the digital realm, in the online world, when it comes to the algorithm solving the problems of spam, for example, and when it comes to, for example, having a psychic experience, when it comes to going from spirituality to religion proper, when it comes to going from sutra, which is general for all adults, towards tantra, which is only for those adults who can handle it, I think throwing the antagonist button out there to everybody to push it, it may be not the best thing to do. But I think the antagonist button should definitely be available, hidden behind the bar dab suit, and when you're ready for it, then you press the antagonist button. Because on the matter of identification, it, it feels to me like uh, religion is also interesting because those who don't press so much the antagony button and go through these things uh, will perhaps have a higher uh, uh, propensity to identify with sort of positive affirmative signifiers, whereas there will be others, perhaps the most creative ones, 
who uh, will have that sort of inner gambling with the nothingness. The root of the phallus is precisely what stands in front of meaninglessness in the abyss, whereas the pre which is what happens when you press the antagony button. You throw the dice, why they don't fall, you don't know what number will emerge. It's precisely meaninglessness. And that's, that's the beauty of, of sort of the only way to be Christian is to be Christian atheist. And that those are the only true Christians like Christ, like God as you know, Christ, before he died, he doubted himself. He was like, why have you forsaken me? And precisely there is the fulfillment of the prophecy, namely the root of the phallus. In other words, whenever we see these two types, Sutra and Tantra, there will be those who identify, who will name, who will box in things. But the real creators one, creative ones will see the religious fiction for what it is, an illusion, a materially constructed illusion that nonetheless, its appearance is fundamental, but it is just appearance as appearance. Uh, which is what Bar uh, what, what Cadell, I think, was saying about the inclusion of surprise within your own being. And I think that also leads to, has some connection to absolute knowing, like the yeah. knowing that the only absolute thing is nothingness. It's like, there's nothing here. We are here. So, so I think that that dichotomy is going to emerge, uh, but it's not so much going to be within the inner, inner sanctum. It's topology will not be inner closed sanctum, outer group, and then everybody else in the sutric realm, but it's going to be, like in every atom of reality, all three of them will be presently present at there. I don't know if I made myself clear, but I, I think the the structurally very precise when you said the root of the phallus stands in front stands as a guard of the abyss, and the antagony button is the abyss itself. So you have to include within yourself surprise and the antagony all the way down to the root of the phallus and up. So you can't you can't do you can't do spiritual bypassing. Like it, it's like the, the 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 biggest trap with spiritual bypassing that I see are basically people who um, have included superficial differences um, with with within their identity, but not deep, not 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 on a deep level, not in an embodied level, not in their personal life, not. So, so you, there's that's, no that's the opposite of movement, here. right? That's the opposite of movement. It is making the concrete appear metaphysical and supernatural and abstract. Whereas the real fucking movement of, of understanding like how to create religions is, is looking at the concrete right here, right now as the sacred or as the absolute, like the fucking struggle right here. I'm hungry. That's God. But that's I, it. I, I, I don't think you can talk about religions that way because they're crappy religions and great religions. And we must differentiate between the two. And I, I think basically using the terminology here, the root of the phallus presses the antagony button. That's when you're ready to press it. You're more than ready to press it. That's the root of the phallus. You press the button, you become the phallus. And then we see if the phallus arrives or not. And then the phallus integrates and becomes phallic, meaning it acts. Because the antagony button has changed it and it can act on that information until it's finished with that action over and done with, it's again a road of the phallus, presses another antagony yeah, button, yeah, and the whole yeah. process repeats itself. Because no antagony button is like the next antagony button. Exactly, no yes, yes, like. yes, yeah, yeah. It's a repetition which never repeats, the impossibility Oof. of repetition. <laughs> it, it, it is It is the event. Then Pressing the antagonist button is the event. And then you must integrate the event to then become a root of the phallus again, to then be able to press the next antagonist button, and it goes on forever. To, to me, to me, just to build on that, there, there is a, there's a pseudo repetition, which is imaginary, which basically pretends it can be self-similar. I think Bard mostly links this to women's mythological universe and nomadology. But like the deep truth of the what we're calling kind of comedically the antagony button is like is this is this impossible repetition which reveals what in my language would be that that negativity is the truth what i mean by that is that the non-identity the otherness of identity is the truth hmm. you're absolutely right there's no antagony so button beautiful. at all the nomadology so for example hinduism there's no antagony button everything is a repetition of the same of the same of the same so you just reincarnate it. You're born into the same life again. Where would the antagonist button be? It cannot be within the pagan religion. It cannot be within something eternal that repeats itself. It's only about believing that the eternal repetition of the same has suddenly has a difference. That difference in the loss, that difference within the repetition is the possibility of the antagony. And if you press it, then off you go in a different direction. Right? And I think I'm just getting an idea here from our conversation, which I love. 
is that I think in my own personal life, what I, what I've, what I've learned unconsciously and now maybe I'm bringing consciously is that, um, what women love is a man who basically is their own personal antagony button, but in a way that sort of contains them safely. Like, meaning you're not an antagony button that's going to harm me. You're an antagony button. And I like that because it's constantly disrupting me. But you're it's, not going it's, to- it's even more than that. What the woman wants is for you to press the antagony button, make money because it just did it so she can buy better shoes. She she wants the reward. She wants the reward. She wants the benefit of you pressing the antagonist button. But I, she wants you to press it. That is what phallus is. But I think it's more than she wants shoes. I do think also woman wants the self insight that can come from that. Yeah, I think woman also wants deep self insight that only she can get from a deep relationship with a man. Owen, what do you and, say? And she wants. Oh, look. Yes, and absolutely. Owen's got no, a huge like that, you know, in, in colloquial men's, uh, men's work language. That's just setting boundaries, right? You set a boundary. That's being antagonistic to your woman. You say, no, that's not okay. No, we're not doing that. Bang. We're going to do this. Your desire wants to go blah, 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 blah. But no. That's a simple way of framing it, I think. Yeah, because there's an antagony between man and woman and you're not supposed to be the other, right? So you stay within your arm by allowing the other to be the other in that. that, that, in that. But when we talk about the antagony button, it means it transforms you, so you change. So you're no longer the old eye, you're a new eye, and that's different. And I think that goes very much into the masculine realm, and that's why we use terminology like phallus and the root of the phallus. The root of the phallus is the preparation to make the phallus possible. So to make the phallus possible, the root of the phallus must be there. So therefore, it's the priest who personifies the root of the phallus because he personifies the will to intelligence. He gathers all of history up until now and declares it as a necessity, amor fati Nietzsche. And then the chief personifies the phallus who then acts after the, after the priest has created the foundation for the chief on which to act with risk and transcend the current state. And for all of us to be able to do that in a smaller scale for men, that means pressing the antagonist button and challenge ourselves into becoming new selves. And that's, uh, personally speaking, why a while ago I was arguing for what is really risky within this context of meaning crisis thinking, let's call it. Is it, is it really risky to go out and investigate new technologies and like connect with other geeks uh, who uh, feel like the next they're going to be the next Zuckerbergs or is it something else what, where's the real risk here is to travel close to the uh, I don't know it's, it's to go and work for me. Google Daniel that's what you want to do that's your dream you want to suck the big dick and be fucked by it no come on I acknowledge my point man because it's not going to be my, my, there's something there's a fine line here of true risk and not the, the image the capitalist image of risk because if your image of risk means bootstrapping it in a garage and getting all these fucking name dropping techie words here and there, mm, I don't feel like that's something because you're just speaking it to enchant yourself to think you're doing something. But where's the real risk in, 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 in today's meaning crisis thinking? And I feel that's the answer that's going to be answered in the next two years. I don't know the answer. I'm just bringing in the big corporations because I feel. But da Daniel, that, that's old tech. That's tech like 15 years ago. Today, tech is content creation. I mean, Netflix is much bigger than Google these days and more important. It's all about the storytelling now. And you're part of that yourself by your dreams about orthodox design. You are a narrator. So it's all about creating narratives now. We, we got the tech there. Better algorithms will be created as long if there's only competition between algorithms, we'll have the free and open algorithms quite quickly. That can happen. That could be around the corner. And we'll certainly be liberating. I mean, the, exact, the same way Google created webmail and therefore saved us against spam the last time, now we need to get saved against spam better and more, more, and more, more resolutely this time. But today, tech is no longer tech. Today, tech is content creation and co-creation and creating platforms of further co-creation. That's where it's at. And, and the question is then what kind of narratives do we create? And they, are these qualitative narratives that just you know, soak people into narratives so they become consumptarians, meaning they will never press the antagonist button? Or is this narratives that you know, you know, motivates people to one day be able to press the antagonist button themselves? Another That's thing that I want to acknowledge. If I had all the means to create all the narratives and all the antagonist buttons, and if I could design them, I'm not going to promise that I'm going to create something for the general good. That's risk, number one. So 
to, there's the monstrosity that comes with power. And, and if that monstrosity is, is at play within our concepts, then something is being said that is somewhat true. And, and, and I do agree with, with, with this sort of creating narratives is creating the use cases, is creating the functions of the next human beings because the functions right now are, are secular uh, uh, theological individualistic functions. But the functions of the human tomorrow, they're gonna be, it's gonna be a whole new uh, assemblage of fucking things within in flows and it's gonna be a whole different monster. And this That's is why we love you and keep you on a lead. But that is the spirit. I mean, what the priest does when he accumulates all the intelligence from everything to until now, so the Amor Fati can be declared. He does declare the root of the phallus as the foundation of the temple in which the chief is then anointed to go out and fight the war. The war means the entire tribe can be extinct tomorrow morning. The entire tribe is risked by the chief. But the possibility of conquering another territory and expand the territory and have a larger land and a promised land or a promised emperor, whatever, motivates the chief to do it. And if he's not allowed to do it, men die. We cannot be men without it. We cannot be men without fathers. It's impossible. And that is what contemporary state ideology and academia are dreaming. The dreaming that men can all be castrated and the official version of that is pacifism. And the other version of that is vegetarianism, because pacifism and vegetarianism are actually the two enemies of men, because men are what? Warriors and hunters in anything they do. That means it's the attack on the fallacy you're watching right now, and it's officially declared as something good called pacifism and vegetarianism, for example. Say pacifism, that's the easier enemy to strike against. Pacifism is essentially saying that we must never, ever take a risk ever again. And if you don't do that, we'll all become Hindus, we'll become pagan again, we'll become dirt poor, We'll all live in an eternal return of the same. We'll all be castrated and our penises will be lame forever. That's the alternative. That's what feminism is now offering us. Nothing else. It is, so the most, the- it is the most beautiful men in Sweden. The most gorgeous men. The men with the hardest, biggest dicks. They're now being locked up in Sweden accused of rape <laughs> that they never committed. Can anything be more a couple apocalyptic than that? And I'm living right in the middle of it and I'm fighting with the lawyers and I'm backing them up and I'm creating a monastery for these guys so when they do get out of prison because they're not killed at all, we're going to fight them back to the very end. And we don't, I mean, this is such an obvious struggle for me. I don't need to motivate my life. You know, the rest 30 years of my life will just be nothing but this struggle. Nothing else. Ladies and gentlemen, if you want the hardest and biggest dicks in the world, go to Swedish jail. And find a rapist who never committed rape and get fucked by him. <laughs> <laughs> I have a long that list of them. Call is me. What we Call will be working ready. on in 2022. Uh, no, I mean, so we got about like 10, 15 minutes left, right? Um, I was wondering, maybe I'd be curious to just ask you all. What do you think are the kind of big projects for 2022? Where are you guys interested to be working? I mean, like I can start, I think, working in terms of the men's movement and trying to get it to think a bit more social, a bit more deep anthropological. Like I think a lot of the men's movement today has been building out of an American individualist Jungian tradition, which is great. It's taken it to a certain point. It's lots of hero's journey stuff, but it doesn't think about the difference between men that well. I think a lot of the the gender dynamics are perhaps slightly utopian, naive, not thinking about technology and the new forms of relationship that are possible with technology. Um, then there's the kind of the educational aspect like we're doing with the Media Academy and trying to teach more people to think in terms of being like a digital proletariat. Um, and then probably like with techno-social, not quite sure what the angle with it is next. I think the interest is probably along the lines of this kind of anthropology to go deeper into the roots of the phallus in our own work, to look more at violence and sex and what it means with technology today. Yes, I agree completely. I think the future of men's work is what I call archetypology. It is the intense study in practice, collectively by men, in what kind 
of men are there? And then exploring those differences and admire each other for it and just loving it. And that means we need to take the guys off from the sutric stage, which is what I call the Harry Potter games of men's movement. So the Harry Potter games of men's movement is like playing around with those heroes' journeys, and which is, you know, sutric, it has to be done. But that's being done already, and I'm looking forward to that. And I think the discussion on that, but only the discussion of it, is the format that I call the Cigar and Cognac Club, which this is an example of right now. This is the guys involved here, the four of us to start with. It's a cigar and cognac club. It means it's men meeting with cigars and cognacs. I mean, really, it's a serious, intense discussion about what it means to be man or what it means to be human in contemporary society. That's what we do, right? But I think it also has to be explored. I haven't, I'm not good on that. So I haven't really figured out what the kind of physical or more body oriented aspect of that could be. If it's, for example, training men in tantric sex, well, then women would have to be in the room, I think, too. But, you know, I'm not an expert on that. I, I, I'm just, I'm basically focused on what I'm good at, my archetype, which is the theory and the theory of the practice a, in terms of creating a proper male archetypology. It's, it's far from finished. The, the work on the male archetypology needs data. It needs intense work. It needs lots of different antagonists being thrown into the mix. But I think archetypology is the name of where the men's movement has to go. What does it mean to capture all of masculinity and then practice it? Mm. I guess what kind of from... formats would that require? What yeah. kind of medias? What kind of physical events? What kind of digital events, et cetera, would that require? <clears throat> I think my, my, my plan for this year ties a little bit with, with what you both said. Technosocial is going to have its monstrous season, namely it has to deal with these topics. I think that ties into uh, this other bit of, of my life that's coming to terms right now, which is I'm going to get this, this ontological design book out there in the next couple of months. It's written. I'm just dealing with the logistics of putting it out there. And then I want to create a community of practice. I want to bring ontological design to fruition, to practice out there. Uh, and I want to be, I, I want to be thinking it. And I, I know that I'm thinking it in a way that is going to be applicable, that therefore will leverage the potential of new technologies to design human functions uh, in, in a novel way. And so that's my intention for this year, to connect and to create these communities of practice and to gel with other people, gel with builders and creators and, and somehow discover the new potential for design, technology and humans. In a monstrous manner, of course. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> In a Swedish jail. <laughs> yeah, for, for, for me, I've got um, two courses coming up. One teaching Hegel. Um, and they're sort of basically really uh, my aim is to sort of um, teach a new generation of thinkers about the power of contradiction and negativity as metaphysical categories. Um, I have another course with Owen, uh, The Art of Being a Man, where basically we are going to be holding an actual space um, for contradiction and negative emotions. So, so that's like sort of the intellectual and the embodied aspect of the, of the work. Uh, they're very much linked. Um, I'm also working on a book with Bard where I see basically uh, a lot of the foundation stones uh, were touched on in this podcast, but also in a, a, a recent podcast with uh, Andrew Sweeney and Thomas Hamelrick. I, I, I see the work as um, introducing a relationship between metaphysics and metapsychology, saving dialectics and unconscious thinking as a foundation stone for a new world. Um, and also on a personal level, I, I think more really playing, you know, to, to your point, uh, Frega, about what is real risk uh, today. I just want to quote uh, Nietzsche, where he said, um, the potential of the higher men or the greatest would be to risk life itself, inclusive of their own greatness, in a tossing of dice unto death. Uh, so definitely not a capitalist game, but like here, I, I really want to Hegelianize Nietzsche um, by uh, introducing that the death of identity can be played with uh, at the location of contradiction, not just anything goes, but to play around with where is the contradiction in, in the present moment of my identity uh, and where can I sort of kill myself 
uh, you know, and, and transform myself. Um, and, and I think in a, in a, in a Lacanian sense, I also think that there is a way in which that that is connected to jouissance or a way in which that is connected to sexual enjoyment. Um, so I want to pay attention to that dimension in myself and, um, yeah, that should be a fun year and hopefully lots of surprise and hopefully lots of antagony buttons and hopefully our space gets more real and connected more to, I want our space to become more focused on sexuality, money, power, uh, making it more real, sexual conflict, digital conflict. This is why I'm working with Kadal because with John said, because I'm going to finish with the sixth book and we are, we are really the voice of the merchant priest. That's what we try to do all the time. The hunter priest, the merchant priest. That's what John and I try to do all the time. With Cadell, there's a certain war priest added. <laughs> and I think what it is, is to lay a foundation, period, right? A total root of the phallus. Because at, at, when we start with Hegel, it's because Hegel would never, ever recognize the meaning crisis. Now, he would just say, this is a dialectical state. Get over it. There are no meaning yeah. crises in Hegel. <laughs> they never were. That, that's John Favarki's term. No, and he's not a Hegelian. He doesn't get Hegel. No, he Hegel says there are no meaning crises at all. It's just, you know, it's just different states of nihilism all the time. That's all there is to it. So you just you go from the next stage of nihilism to the next stage of nihilism, depending on technological circumstances. But otherwise, you know, you go towards an event, hopefully not just towards a repetition of the same. I, I just I, I think I think I, I totally agree with Bard about what he's saying about Hegel and the meaning crisis. Um, but I would just like. I just have this hilarious image in my head of Hegel actually saying, like, there is no meaning crisis. Just get over it. Like, <laughs> like get over it. <laughs> or like Hegel said about the orbs, he would say the same thing. Oh, it's a meaning crisis. All right. Yeah. So his, his, uh, this, and this is my view about this is my view about the outside. Like, in I don't know, I think this is returning somehow. Like, there's this tendency to want to, like, get to the great outside. Um, But, like, there's a funny story where, like, um, Hegel's friends wanted him to, like, appreciate and reflect on nature more so they they brought him out to the alps to look at a beautiful Al alps mountains and then they brought him there and then he goes just like yeah there there it is like what do you want me to say about it it's like i already dialecticized the mountains it's like, <laughs> it's like <laughs> oh we're gonna have to do the same with you in a few years cadell when we wheel you out of swedish jail <laughs> <laughs> but i think it speaks volumes to the fact the priest is very cold cool and it, its chief is very, very passionate. And that's why the chief, the chief is basically an explosion. The phallus is an explosion. Whereas the root of the phallus is coldly built over long periods of time. So the, the, the perspective of the priest, which is very Hegelian, the perspective of the priest is like thousands of years ago and thousands of years in the future. And we are here right now and we're just small, small, small things within a big, larger picture. And that's it. Right. That's why, why it's a little contemporary meaning crisis in the media in 2020, 2021. Yeah. Isn't that big of a deal? It's like a pandemic. It's just one of millions of pandemics. What the fuck is this? Right. Whereas the, 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 the chief is very here and now incredibly passionate, must be an explosive because otherwise history doesn't move. And that's exactly what the priest said. Thank God there's a chief who just explodes, you know, the way a phallus should do. That's why just, it's not the priest himself. The priest just, himself, just, the phallus. Just to emphasize what Bard's saying here about the priest being very cold and like almost has a gaze that's like thousands of years old and it's thousands of years into the future is like in the in the first chapter of, of our book. Um, basically, there's this this reflection on, you know, like that the entropic state of the universe, like billions of years, trillions of years into the future, everything's going to be nothing. And then I just said, you know, like we're still thinking we're thinking in this abyss. You know, like that's the gate, like that's the, the the level at which we're thinking. That's the coldness at which we're thinking. The silence of the universe is like a mockery and we're still here. And it's got- Exactly, we're still here, motherfucker. Past, we're still here and I'm we're still- We're still here. Like, Fuck. And we're turning into a rap outfit. We're no longer the Beatle. <laughs> a capella. Well, guys, shall we wrap it? This has been fun as fuck. Yeah, this is great. And Kidal, you've got to go to another meeting. Alexander, you've got a dinner. I'm going to go speak to John Viveki with Andrew and, uh, oh, and Christopher Maestro Priotra as well. Uh, Daniel, I don't know what you're doing this evening. I'm going to have dinner with my parents. Oh, okay. Uh, very, very eatable for such a schizophrenic yeah. little boy. 
Of course. <laughs> appearance <laughs> as appearance. It's not eatable enough, mate. <laughs> <laughs> And if and if we survive the risk taking we have ahead of us, we'll have another four of them soon. Oh hell yes, Jens, in a bit. All right, peace out. Thanks for having us.